Okay, so uh, I'm going to continue today with the discussion on distributed systems. And last time we talked a little bit about uh, uh, some, some uh, uh, design of toolkit, I guess is the way to put it, and uh, you know processes and threads and RPCs, transactions. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is what I would think of as design techniques, which is how do you structure a system. And so what I'm going to do is talk about uh, the, issue, uh, the techniques of hierarchy, replication and failover, indirection, multiplexing, virtualization, soft state. These are all uh, how you structure a system, and I'm going to explain them mostly by giving you examples of existing systems. And so hopefully you'll get a chance to see how current systems like, you know, Google and Facebook, uh, Twitter, things like that. How are they structured? How do we make them scale? How do we make them reliable? Uh, and have all the properties that, we, that I discussed about last week. Okay, let me start with the first one, which is hierarchy. Okay, so uh, so hierarchy uh, basically means uh, having something structured in the form of a tree, okay? And hierarchy is a natural way of doing scaling. So when you want to make something big, it's, it's, it's a, a natural thing to do is hierarchy, okay? So what do you mean by hierarchy? In the, in the uh, natural world, uh, hierarchy means that you take something big and you break it up into smaller pieces, and the small piece sort of looks like the big piece, okay? So to take an example, when you look at a, a, a river system, right? You have a big river, but then the river has creeks coming into it, and the creeks have smaller brooks coming into it, and in a stream, and so on. So you have this structure where, you know, you have the small little things merged together and form larger things, which form larger things, and so on. And then in the end, you have sort of the main river, and of course, the same thing is true of a tree, where you have you know, leaves and branches and twigs and all the way up to the main trunk, okay? And so what we're seeing over here is that whatever happens at the main level is actually decomposed into smaller pieces, okay? And that's the same thing for your blood vessels. You have the main blood vessel, they break up into smaller pieces, into capillaries and so on and so forth. In a distributed system, we use these insights to, discuss, to design a system like DNS, the domain name system. And what we do over here is that we treat the whole namespace, the domain namespace as being this very large thing, but to actually uh, serve it, we actually break it up into what looks like a tree. So let's take an example of a name like we talked about earlier, server101.cs.uwaterloo. And we want to translate from this into an IP address. Okay, that's our goal. So we have many, many names, billions, you know, hundreds of billions of names, and we want to translate them all. The monolithic approach would be to have a single sort of database in the sky, and we know by now that that's not a good idea because of scalability, because of other issues. But what we're going to do here is to break it up. And the way we do it is to use this approach of what's they call delegation. In some sense, what happens in a natural system is that we're saying, okay, in order to, you know, we're going to take some part of the river, so to speak, and delegate it to a branch, okay? In the same way, what we're saying is we delegate part of the namespace to some, some, some other part. So the root delegates this name to CA, CA delegates this to U Waterloo, U Waterloo delegates the name to CS, and then CS actually handles this name over here. And so we have a tree. We have a very large tree, and you can see how the tree will be constructed. You have at the root, you have .ca, you know, .us, .com, .edu, et cetera, and then they in turn do this. And so we get this very large number of servers able to handle it without stepping on each other's toes, okay? And that's how we get hierarchy. So whenever you see a system which is very large, the first question you can ask yourself in order to design a system is, is there a natural way to introduce a hierarchy? Is there a way by which you can, you can split up the overall system into pieces that are uh, not stepping on each other's toes? If there's a natural way to partition it, uh, okay. I will wait for you to settle down and you know, stop making a noise. 
Yeah. So once you can discover such a natural uh, uh, space, then it becomes easy to build in hierarchy. Okay. So in DNS, it's nice. DNS becomes quite easy, but in other places, it's not as straightforward, right? So in some ways, uh, we we get hierarchy by using an implicit approach to it. And let me explain what by, what I mean by that. The implicit hierarchy says that even though explicitly we don't have any particular uh, uh, hierarchy, we can actually find something underneath. So let me give an example of this. And that's, let's say you have to, you log into your Yahoo homepage. When you log into your Yahoo, Yahoo homepage, most people are logging into the Yahoo server, which is close to them, right? Which is in that geographical region. And what is the close geographical region? Well, your IP addresses are geographically associated. We know that. We know that for scaling. So your Yahoo homepage is actually not available everywhere in the world, or not easily available everywhere. In fact, it's kept, if you're in Canada, your IP address for Canada is going to be uh, kept at the Yahoo server on Canada. So we have a hierarchy, OK? And then you can actually go down, because we can localize your IP address down to, let's say, Kitchener. Yahoo may decide to put a server in Kitchener, OK? And then say, OK, your IP address is going to be served locally. So what we do is we take the entire space of all home pages, which is very large, and we break it up into geographical regions. And then we can have a hierarchy where we, we basically put each local home page over here. So all the, this could be Kitchener K KW, this could be Toronto, for example, and so on. And these would serve Canadian content, and you'd have some serve for Canada. And then there'd be some other servers for different countries, and then there'd be some root. So this hierarchy for the Yahoo home pages, I mean, I, I'm guessing this is what they do, OK? And this is what I would do if I were running it. Because obviously, you don't want to have all the home pages with the you know, terabytes and terabytes of content uh, all in one single server somewhere. Okay, you want to break it up into this hierarchy because there is this implicit hierarchy that says that basically we want to refer to content which is local for the most part, right? We, 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 we want to keep that local over here. Okay, so that, that is another example of hierarchy. Okay, any questions about this so far? So, in one case, we have an explicit namespace. The other case, we have like an implicit uh, uh, solution over here. Okay. So uh, the, the general idea is to try and take the large problem and break it up into smaller pieces somehow. Okay. Make sense? Okay. It's pretty straightforward. And in fact, it's sort of the easiest thing to do. And when possible, you should use hierarchy. Unfortunately, it's not always, it's not always possible. To give you an example of where hierarchy is not possible, let's say you want to do Google search. Could you do a hierarchy on that? Could you? Uh, yeah, you could just store all the, the uh, local. Sort of. What is local, though? Um, your location. So, because Google caches all the sites on the internet, indexes the internet, basically, right? So yeah. You just uh, hold that, say, in Toronto. Mm -hmm. with your local. But, the, but that's not local, right? I mean, anybody anywhere in the world could search for anything. Right? There's no particular reason to, to, to cache that locally. Okay, maybe Google Maps you would have, but even you know, there's no particular reason why somebody in Antarctica couldn't search for street map in you know, Waterloo. So we don't have locality. So Google search is an example of where you cannot actually do hierarchy. There is no hierarchy there. Yeah. You can do hierarchy on the prefix of a search. So you could have like A through Z being one level of the hierarchy, then you could have A to sure. AN and yes. AN. You, in the search terms, you could do hierarchy, but that would be, it would not be geographical like this. But you could say, here's all the keywords starting with A, here's all the keywords starting with B, and so on. In fact, that's what they do. They actually spread up the, the space into not just A, but even smaller, right? And so each server is responsible for one part of the third space. So that's hierarchy uh, uh, sort of at the data center level rather than geographically speaking. Right? So geographically, it doesn't work. But inside a data center, sure, you could do that. In fact, they have to do that. There's no way for one server to do all of it. Okay. Any other, so, okay. So we have to be careful of picking the right place to put the hierarchy in because the right way is the way to put it. Okay. But where where it where you can do it, it's really great because it spreads the load, it splits up nicely, and so on. Okay. And everything comes down to delegation, and so you have to find look for the I mean the, the I would say look for the namespace. That's really the 
Okay. And that's the trick. If you find the right namespace, the like keyword space, or the geographical space, or in this case, the DNS space that can be partitioned, then you're in luck. You can actually use hierarchy. Everything just works. Okay. All right, so that's the first one. Let me talk about the second one, which is actually a bit more complex and also something that gets used a lot. And uh, it's, I'm going to actually cover three things at the same time. So one is replication, and under that, failover. And under that, the most common failover technique is called primary backup. OK. So let's start with uh, replication. Replication, the simple idea is that if you have more than one copy, it's unlikely that things will fail. OK, so you have your hard drive, you have some your homework assignment on it, and you don't want to lose it, so you replicate it on a, on a backup drive. Okay? So that's, in fact, your primary is your hard drive, and then you have backup drive, and that's primary backup. In case your primary work, uh, stops working, you switch over to the backup, and that's failover. So that's the concept. Very simple. Make copies and uh, choose the one that's working. And when, you, when you're using the backup one, create another backup, you know, so we make this the primary and create another backup and then you'll be fine, okay? So that's the, uh, that's the idea over here. Again, this is extremely uh, powerful way of doing things. So to explain replication in a bit more uh, detail, I'm going to actually show you uh, the structure of the, what's called the Google file system. This is how they store files on Google. OK, so let's look at the use of replication for a file system. So I'll first start with describing how we do files on a typical sort of Unix server today or a Windows server today, and then why it doesn't work. So the way you do files today is that we have a hard drive. And on this hard drive, we basically have a tree of files. You know, we have some slash something, and we put some you know, tree of things. And then underneath it, we have some sort of directory. So you have some fairly natural tree structure, and that's the way that we store files on a hard drive today. This is what you do on servers. This is what your laptop or desktop machine is going to look like. Okay, So that's easy. Now, what happens if the disk fails? Well, if you don't have a backup, you lost everything. Okay, That's one problem. That's a failure problem. A bigger problem has to do with what happens if you have a lot of load on it. So right now, your, your laptop has got some load on the disk, and hopefully it's matched. You know, it's not very heavy load. But if you're a server, you could have, instead of just your local laptop accessing the disk, you could have many clients. You could have one client, 10 clients, 100,000 clients, and the disk load is going to change, and that's not going to work. Jay, you have a question here? <laughs> yeah, you have a question, Vincent? Not really. Not really. What, what are you trying to clarify? What this is? No, no, like the previous notes. The previous notes. <laughs> okay, you can ask me after class. Okay, all right. So, when you have a load increasing like this, you can't. You know, the disk is going to basically become the bottleneck. You're not going to be able to access it fast enough. So, what you could do is this: you could put two disks like this, and then copy the file system over. And so now you have two copies. So the request coming to the client could either go here or they could go there, right? And now we essentially double the capacity of the disk I.O. You can have, you know, if you can do whatever, 100,000 accesses a second, now you can do 200,000 accesses a second by replicating, and that's great, OK? So if you're just reading only, if you have a read-only system, then replication is basically free. Okay. You just make as many copies as you wish, and everybody's only reading. Good, no problem. Life gets hard when you start being able to read and write. Okay, when you have read and write, this file. Let's say you change this file over here. Well, you've got to change that one too. Otherwise, they're out of out of, out of sync. They're not consistent. So you lost consistency. Okay, so you say, okay, wait a minute, I'm not going to change this until I change that. So I'm going to make both of them change at the same time. You now introduce atomicity. Okay, if you do atomicity, you have to worry about 
all the problems of failure. So I start updating this, I get a lock on this, I get a lock on that, I start updating both, and then this one dies, for example. So now I have to break the lock, right? So you can see right away that the minute you have a read, write, and you want to maintain consistency, you got to do a lot of extra work. You have to worry about failure of this one or that one or both at the same time. And you have to maintain a lock manager. You have to worry about mutual exclusion. All the stuff we looked at last week, you kind of suddenly in that. Okay, the minute you do read write. So read only is easy, and read write is difficult. <coughs> That's very difficult actually. So just by making one change from read only to read write, you've got a whole lot of problems coming up. Okay, for now, to go back to Google, let's go to the read only system just to show you how that works. Okay, so one problem, so the replication, uh, so the advantages, let me just write that down. The first one, with, with we get more capacity. Okay. So that's good, right? Which means you can scale easily. On the other hand, that's a plus. On the other hand, uh, the disadvantages. Okay, it's a negative. First one is it costs more, right? Because you've got to have more. And the second one is maintaining consistency is a problem. Okay, and the third one is dealing with failure. And what I mean by that is that here I showed you how to take one dr dr disk drive and make it into two. Okay, what Google does actually is to take this and make it into a hundred thousand. Okay, they just have copies all over the place. All right. In fact, what they do is a bit more than that. So let me explain what they do. The first thing they do is they take the, 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 the tree. I'm just going to draw the tree. Maybe it's easier that way. So this is the, the file system tree of files. Something like that. Okay. And what they do is they take some set of files like this set over here. Okay. And all of these will be put on one, will belong to one disk. Okay, so then we've got hierarchy over here. So one disk will be responsible for this part of the tree. What is this tree? This could be the search tree, for example, right? So if you have each keyword, then you could say, you know, this is, this is all this is over here is whatever, aardvark is over here somewhere, okay? And that would be somewhere like zebras over there. So that's the search space tree. And this set of keywords, this set of names is responsible over here. And this, they replicate three times. OK? They replicate it three times on three different drives. So you get hierarchy plus you get replication. OK? So when a search request comes in, what happens is that you say, oh, what search, what, what term are you typing? You're typing A, A, whatever it is. As you type it, and A, A, that actually already is being sent over here to this set of servers over here. And you pick one of the three because it's replicated. Okay, and this also decreases the load. So the, you get uh, more capacity, you know, decreases the load, so you get scaling. And so this server starts getting the, 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 the uh, text as you're typing in. So AAR says, okay, this is the server, this, this, this is the part of the name I'm gonna be searching over here. And you have, in this case, three. The reason you have three is because hopefully all three wants fail at the same time, okay? And the failure, dealing with failure part comes in because if you have 100,000 servers, as I said, about 20 are going to die every single day. 20 disks are going to die every day. Okay. So Google's approach is let it die. It's not a big deal. As soon as it dies, you throw it away. You're a person with a, with a garbage can going through the stacks of all the servers every day, you know, pulling out the failed hardware, you know, all the failed routers, the failed disk drives, the failed computers, pulling them off and replacing them with new stuff. And as you put in new stuff, the existing uh, drives will copy their stuff over, okay? So they'll, they'll make their three copies. That's one, there's the other one, there's the third one. 
And so what you're going to do is that these, these guys will copy down whatever you have into the remaining one that's new, and life goes on, right? And so by maintaining this replication plus hierarchy, you get, you get essentially very good scaling, okay? Uh, and that is basically how the, you know, there's a, quite a bit more to it, but that basically this is the key idea behind the Google uh, file system. And this, the approach has not been used, it's called the HD, is it HDFS? No, uh, Hadoop file system, I guess that's call it, HFS or HDFS, I can't remember what the exact acronym is. The Hadoop file system is basically a similar kind of approach where we, we, we spread the files across many, many drives and maintain the structure and then we use this hierarchy plus replication, and this allows us to scale, okay? If we do this kind of approach, and there's, again, there's more depth in, in dealing with, this is read-only, it works very well, as I said. If you do read-write, okay, you have to be pretty careful about how you do it, but it has been solved, okay? We can actually build file systems today which can be as large as we want. You want it petabytes, no problem. Okay. In fact, uh, uh, almost, uh, let me see, yeah, so if I'm not mistaken, as of 2006 already, Google was writing a petabyte a day of storage. Uh, one, each day is a petabyte, okay? And how much does a petabyte cost? It's about a million dollars, okay? If you Google a million dollars a day, it's not a big deal. And so every single website in the world was being written by the search engines every single day, a petabyte a day. So uh, somebody I used to work with when I was at Bell Labs worked for Google, and uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, basically this is what, they, they, I mean, they, they tell you this is what they're doing. It's not a secret that they're, every single search, every single, uh, every search that's done, every website is archived every single day. So they, they, they quite openly tell you that, and, and it's about a petabyte a day. And that's what they're saving. So we know how to build this. Okay. So replication. So the advantages, you get more capacity and scaling. Disadvantages, you know, as I said, costs more. You have to maintain consistency if you're doing read-write and then dealing with failure. So let's talk about dealing with failure a little bit. The uh, simplest way of dealing with failure is to designate one of the replicas as what's called primary, which is what's going to be used all the time. And then the other one is being backup, which is not going to be used, but maintains a copy at all times. Right? That's exactly what you have when you have your backup on a, on a hard drive, external hard drive. You're always backing up. You aren't really using it. But if you need to, you can start using it. And that's what happens with the, with the backup. Um, backups are, you know, we can think of something called hot backup or a cold backup. And a hot backup, what happens is that the backup is always up to date all the time. Right? So every single write you make to this disk, you also make a write over there. And that would be what's called a RAID 1 system. For those of you doing IT management, that's a RAID 1, full replication. And this way, both drives can be used at any time. Okay? However, the way you do backups, typically in your home computer, would be to backup once an hour or once a day. When you do that, you can't really use both at the same time because this is always a little bit out of date. You have writes. It's on a read-only system. It's a read-write workload. We are able to we, we write over here. We're not writing over there, and so that's not hot. Okay. The other place where you have primary backup, just to bring back something in the networking world, is to sh I'll show you how we typically build uh, how we build uh, uh, reliable networks today. And we're just going to illustrate with it, uh, illustrate the University of Waterloo interconnection. So this is University of Waterloo, and it wants to have. The, the AS, let us say, autonomous system, and we want to look at how to maintain connectivity at all times to, for all the things. The way we do it is we have basically two ISPs, and I think if you remember, one of them is Hydro One, and the other one is Orion. So Hydro One and Orion have some access router. So what we do is that we essentially have two routers that are campus primary routers, and they both connect to both systems over here. And each of the internal campus routers will also connect to both of them. OK? So you can see that this is the structure of the, so this would be math, for example. And then internally we have, here internally we don't care so much about alternate paths, because if this goes, only one part of the network is gone, it's not a big deal. 
Look at this, we want to have available all the time, right? So here, what happens is that we could designate, okay, we, uh, we could, we don't do it this way actually, but we could, we could designate this to be the primary and this to be the backup, okay? And so if you designated the shaded one to be primary and that the backup, then what would happen is that in a normal course of events, we would, all, everything would go through these highlighted paths. And then from there, it could go either to Hydro One or to Orion. So the, the, the shaded links would be the ones that would be used, okay? That would be if we were to run it as primary backup. But primary backup is inefficient because we have all these resources over here that are not being used. It's like saying I have this hard drive, okay? Uh, in my external hard drive, but I'm not using it. It's just sitting there, right? If, I, if I'm going to back it up every day, that hard drive is whatever, $150 worth of equipment just sitting there not doing anything for me. These are far more expensive, okay? So primary backup is not a good idea but for such ex expensive equipment. So what we do instead is that we use basically the uh, routing protocol to choose shortest paths. And we choose shortest paths that go either through here or through there. So for example, if we have a, uh, an uh, autonomous system over there, then we'll use this path. This computer will use this path over here rather than the path on top, which is likely to be longer. The beauty of this is that if for any reason this goes down, this link will become infinite cost over here. This link cost will become infinite, and then we automatically switch over to that. Okay? So by using dynamic routing, we can get the effect of primary backup essentially for free. Okay? In fact, both of them serve as backups for each other. Okay? So in the network context, this approach of having this kind of, uh, uh, we use this, this kind of pattern of going this way and this way, and then you know, another nodes over here connecting to both, this pattern is very, very common. Okay, you'll see it in every single architectural diagram. You'll see this kind of pattern because here we have this nice system where both are available and both serve as backups with each other. Okay. And what we need, of course, is to make sure that they're consistent with each other. And for that, we often introduce this, these dotted lines. These dotted lines basically say that we have to make sure that they are consistent with each other, they're running some kind of routing protocol amongst each other to make sure that uh, they're not have, they don't have inconsistent views of the world. And uh, uh, if you remember the routing protocol, that exact, that dotted line really represents the exchange of routing messages between the two. So this block of four with these connections like this and the dotted lines is sort of the shorthand for a pair of, uh, sorry, two pairs of routers that are mutually redundant, okay? Of course, it's possible that a power spike could cause both of these to go down at the same time, okay? We hope that doesn't happen. We put them on a battery backup or whatever, but uh, if you don't do this, then it's gonna work, okay? And this is one way to get reliability, and uh, so it's a common, so said, common design technique. So if somebody comes to you and says, okay, build me a data center, data center network, and a data center server system, you would, you would, you would immediately say, okay, buy two routers, set it up like this, and between, in, for the router case, the protocol that we use over here is called VRRP, Virtual Routing Replication Protocol. Doesn't matter what it means, but uh, we set it up like that, and at this point, you're pretty good shape, okay? Then you take your data, and you do the primary backup, and you back it up daily, or you do a RAID 1, which is going to do essentially primary backup as well, but then you have a hot backup and you can use both. And if either one fails, the backing up the other. So this is RAID 1 and this are the same idea. Both copies are serving as a backup for each other. Okay? And the idea being that we're not going to have a synchronized failure. Okay? It's unlikely that you're going to have two failures at the same time. If you do have two failures at the same time, you're out of luck. Yeah. With RAID 1, is failover transparent? Yeah. Or do you have to manually? No, it's transparent, which is the nice part. So the, the hardware controller is going to detect that one of the RAID uh, has failed, and then it will automatically you know, basically use the one that the copy that's surviving, and then send you an alert saying, OK, better create another copy. Yeah. So that's what happens. Ryan, you had a question? Yeah. OK. So we see the use of uh, replication and failover. Uh, 
essentially uh, both on the networking side and the distributed system side. Okay? And they have slightly different uh, instantiations, but they have the same idea. And so the simplest case is when you have primary backup and the backup isn't used. And the better case is when you have primary backup and they serve as backups for each other. OK, let's move on to this next technique, which is kind of a, a nice one. It's called indirection. I'll explain how that works. OK. OK, so indirection basically means that some, uh, when you go to a server and you ask it, do you have it? It says, no, I don't, but go there. OK, it just means go there. OK, so let's take a simple example again. We'll take DNS. So we have the root servers. And if you remember the root server, it really has no data. But what it has, it has the, it has the IP addresses of each of the top level domains, of top level domain name servers. So it has a pointer to the .com, for example, .info, okay, the pointer to .net, and so on. And so you have the IP address for each of these. So if you go to a root server and you say, I want to know the translation from google.com. Root server will say, I don't know. But go there. Go to the .com's name server and ask it. Okay? So what you have is basically like the front desk of, of, a, of a company. Right? You go to the front desk and you say, I want to meet with so-and-so. Okay, I don't know. Uh, I don't know the answer. You can go there. Okay? So the good thing about indirection is that it, al it allows us to scale quite easily, again, right? Because you, you, you go into one single point, but that single point doesn't need to have all the answers. All it needs to know is to know where to go, OK? And then they, in turn, may direct you somewhere else. And this is how we get scaling. So indirection goes very nicely with hierarchy, OK? Just like replication goes nicely with hierarchy, indirection goes nicely with hierarchy. So to take example of Google search again, we go to Google dot com, right, and say, I want to search for this term. What's going on is that the front end says, I don't know, but this server should know about it. And that's a, that, go, that server should know about it. And you go all the way down to the server that actually does know about it. And so we're getting hierarchy <coughs> plus indirection. Okay, we, don't, we, 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 we don't need to have all the answers in one single mainframe. We can just push the answers out to the right place. Okay? Um, but the indirection part comes in because the rest of the world doesn't need to know this. From their perspective, you just go to one single location, and that location knows everything. Right? So it's like uh, your, your uh, interface to the rest of the world is very simple. It's just the place you go to, which then indirects you to wherever it needs to be going. And then it happens recursively, and that gives you the scaling that you want. So that's the basic idea of, of indirection. Okay, so yeah. Hierarchy and indirection are coupled to each other. Okay? It's not that uh, hierarchy is an implement. We can have a non-hierarchical indirection as well. Okay? There's no particular reason it should be a hierarchy. Right? Okay. You, could, you, could have indirection in, you could have an arbitrary graph, and you could still indirect along the paths of a graph. Okay? In one sense, IP routing is indirection. I go to my first router and say, deliver this package for me. And the pack is, I don't know, but this is the next stop. I'll forward it there. Maybe that, that router knows, and so on. You can view indirection from that perspective as well. So packet routing is nothing more than indirection. Okay. So from our perspective, our closest router is the rest of the internet. It's all that we care about. If, I don't, if it's not in LAN, I give it to the router and say, forget it, and then that through indirection. But there's no hierarchy there. Right? We don't need hierarchy to have indirection. If you have a hierarchy, you must have indirection, what you're saying? Uh, not quite. I mean, if you have a file system, you don't have indirection per se. You could have a monolithic file system. It has no indirection. It's just a file system. It's hierarchy. 
yeah. You can have you can have one or the other. They're, they're different concepts. Okay. If you have a distributed hierarchy, then it usually goes with indirection. They go well together, but they're, not, they're different concepts. Okay. So uh, indirection so can be thought of as basically saying, here's my front end. And this is the, you can think of as the interface. And this is what you expose to the world. Okay? So everybody thinks this is where the, where the action is. But when you go there, it actually says, you know, here is where you really should be going. And it sends good sense and vitals. Okay? So because we have the ability to change this mapping later on, we don't need to expose this to the rest of the world. So to give you a very particular example, this is used for load balancing, okay, as well. So how does this work? When you go to a server on, again, let's take you know, Facebook.com, you go to Facebook.com IP address, and that IP address actually belongs to the load balancer. Okay, you go to, and says, what, what happens is your request comes in, it picks one of a set of many, many front ends, and just passes it on to that front end over here, saying, here, you take care of it. We don't need to know how many there are in the back end. Okay, if there's a lot of load, you just add more. Because you're doing indirection, you have a separation of responsibilities. I, as a client, don't really need to know the IP address of these back ends. I don't even know where they are or how, you know, I don't know, I don't need to know, right? All I need to know is if I go here, I'll be sent to the right location. And so there's a separation of, of uh, information and this makes life much easier. So Facebook says, hey, I'm getting a lot of load in our Toronto center. Okay, let's add 100 more servers here. No problem, nobody needs to know. It's all being done behind your back, okay? Uh, and so this is, this is, for example, how load balancing works. This is how, as I mentioned, DNS works. This is how internet routing works. And so it's a very, very important uh, approach. And so when you are asked to design a system, you should consider that. You want to say, how much information do I need to actually expose to the rest of the world? How much can I keep internally? And if I can present an interface which is simple and behind it I do whatever I need to do, then I can, then you can use indirection for that. You get a request, you, you say, okay, go somewhere else. Okay. And, and you don't need to expose that until the last minute. Okay. Uh, another place that shows up with indirection is virtual memory. So how many of you are, are familiar with how virtual memory works? Page tables in virtual memory? One, two. <laughs> Okay, uh, all right, so maybe I won't discuss that. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, I'll give you a different example, though, of indirection which you're all familiar with. You all called uh, 800 numbers, right? 800 or 888 or 887, 877 numbers. These are actually not real phone numbers, okay? In fact, if you pay the phone company a certain amount of money every month, you can have your own 800 number, okay? And it'll be 877 my name, whatever it is. Uh, and what happens is that when you call the phone company and, and that 800 number, they have a table that just looks it up. You go to the, the, the interface, is 800 number, okay? But instead, what happens is that call gets sent to the appropriate back end, which is your phone, and the phone rings. So by introducing indirection, okay, we are able to provide you know, toll-free calls because basically you come into here and then it just gets sent forward somewhere else. So all the world needs to know is, yeah, 800 so-and-so is this company, but behind the back you have an entire call center. So different people's desks all receive the same 800 number. So this is how, this is how that works. That's how we scale up the call centers in this way. So all call centers that have these 800 numbers, 877 numbers, are using indirection as well. Okay. All right, so that gives you, that's an example of indirection. Okay, any questions? Yeah. All right, let me do one more thing, which is multiplexing, and then afterwards, I'll, after the break, I'll talk about virtualization and soft state. Okay, so multiplexing. We saw multiplexing quite a long time ago. I just want to remind you what it means. Multiplexing means sharing. That's it. Multiplexing is just sharing. So if you take any anything and I share it, it's multiplex, right? So uh, 
you know, one could, uh, one could say that this classroom is shared by all of you. You know, it's a multiplex classroom. You don't have an individual classroom of your own. You have a shared classroom. If you have a link over which packets flow, that link is shared. It's multiplex because you have different uh, people sharing it. Uh, gets more interesting when you start looking at, uh, at, at, at systems. So let's say you have a, a, a desktop and you want to run Windows and you want to run Mac OS at the same time, right? So you want to share the operating system. You want to share the hardware between two operating systems. That's multiplexing as well, right? So if you have any virtual machine, that's multiplexing. Um, so the reason why we want to share is because it's, it saves cost, OK? That's basically it. If you have any resource whose usage is, uh, has peaks and troughs, so there are times when it's heavily used and times it's not very well used, then it makes sense to try and share it because hopefully when different people are using it, their peaks don't coincide. So if you have somebody uh, who's, uh, who's uh, uh, busy when somebody else is idle and the, you know, the times don't match up, then it's perfect. You don't actually have to work. They each think they own the resource, but in fact, they're sharing it. But sh the saving cost argument is the primary reason for multiplexing. Uh, you can't each have your own road network. Okay? Imagine having your own personal road. Okay, from your home and wherever you go, your own personal road. It kind of doesn't work. Imagine having your own personal airport. Okay, so <laughs> they build airports just for you and your own planes and your own everything. Uh, won't happen. Okay, so we always have multiplexing. So the thing that we have to worry about is how we have to basically demultiplex somehow. Okay, and so demultiplex means that when you put it back into the shared thing and you finish sharing, you want to get your stuff back out again. And so you need an ID and you need a demultiplexing ID at the end of it. And this is exactly what IP addresses and TCP port numbers and things like that are all about. When you put something into the shared thing, you want to get it out again at the end when it's unshared, when you want to actually access it. So that's, that's the, so we can think of all of these things as having demultiplexing uh, IDs that are embedded in it. And as long as you're demultiplexing ID, you're fine. But there's a negative. It's a positive as a shaves cost. Negative is your performance can suffer. So because you don't have your own airport, OK, uh, when you go to the airport, it may be busy. You have to wait in line for things, right? Because you don't have your own road, you're going to be stuck in a traffic jam. Okay? Because you don't have your own search engine that only you own, you may have to wait for your search results. You know, because you don't have your own private link connecting you to the rest of the world, you have to wait for usage of the link. So performance will suffer when you share. And so the whole business trick becomes, how do we make the resource large enough so that most of the time, things are OK? okay? So the classic example of, my, uh, of this is uh, you suppose you're going to build a hotel, right? You're going to build a hotel with 100 rooms. And each room has, a, let's say, a phone in that, and you want to make, and people can make phone calls from the, from the room. So between the hotel and the telephone network, you have a link, and it can carry a certain number of calls, OK? So this link is multiplexed. It's shared amongst all the different rooms. So you have all the rooms over here, and you have 100 rooms, OK? How many calls should you support on that link? If you say n equals 100, then no matter what, no matter when anybody makes a call, you're going to be able to support it, right? Easy. But then it's expensive because you have to pay for 100 calls, and most of the time you aren't going to have 100 calls. Maybe it's very rare, okay? But if you put n equals 1, then only one person can make a call. And the second person tries to make a call, it won't work. So how big should it be? What's the answer? You just you haven't you haven't built the hotel yet, you know, so you don't know what the average is. <laughs> and same thing is true for a cell phone tower. I put up a cell phone tower. Each cell phone tower, if you remember, has like three antennas. So I have you know for each antenna, I can support a certain number of users, typically about sixty or seventy users. So I have a region, and I want to put up a certain number of towers. Okay. So if I put up a few towers, it's cheaper. But then once in a while, somebody's going to pick up the phone. They're going to say, "Sorry, you're busy." OK, uh, that's not good. On the other hand, so what do you do? So the short answer is nobody knows. <laughs> OK, we just don't know. 
we, we have a lot of theory. It's called teletraffic theory and this and that. But it all depends on what is the behavior of these, of these rooms, of these cell phones, of these shared resources. How do they actually behave? And characterizing the behavior, in the end, turns out to be characterizing human beings. And we really don't have a good idea how to do that. If people knew how human beings behaved, there would be no Hollywood flop movies. There would be no planet. What is it, the movie that just flopped? What is it called again? The Mars thing? John Carter. John Carter. There would be no John Carter if we knew how people behaved. Because you wouldn't spend whatever $300 million because you knew exactly who, what people would buy, pay tickets for. So we don't know how people behave. And yet, how people behave decides, decides what it is we need to size for over here. And so the way we do it in real life is we pick a number, okay, and if it's too small, you bump it up, and if it's too large, you bump it down. That's it. Okay, that's, that's basically the best thing to do. So pick a number, you know, that you can afford, and if it's too bad, if, you, if, it, if people are having performance problems, you say, oops, I'd better make it bigger. So you build a road, and then, you know, you say, well, I hope it's going to last five years, and then, oops, I'd better widen it. And if you know the road that goes, pa goes past the boardwalk, you know, in the west side of town, they built it two lanes, and now they're spending, what, $10 million to widen it? Okay, that's because the road is shared, and the traffic was, uh, un was not properly predicted, or you know, people behaved in a way that was unanticipated, and now because of performance suffering, we need to go do it, and that's what we do in real life. You don't actually have a better, can't do much better than that. Okay. Virtualization. Okay, we are down to the last two topics in the last 15 minutes of the course, and I think I'll be able to get it done. All right, so virtualization is a really, really useful and important technique, and you're seeing it all over the place, right? When, when you, so let me ask, how many of you have used a virtual machine, virtual operating system? Okay, pretty much everybody has used a virtual machine. Um, how many of you have seen a Santa Claus in a mall? All of you have seen Santa Claus in the mall. Did you know that Santa Claus in the mall is the same as a VMware virtual machine? <laughs> I guess you didn't. But it's true. Let's think about that for just one moment, and you'll see that it's actually the truth. When you see Santa Claus in the mall, from your perspective, it's a real Santa Claus, at least from your kid's perspective. If you have children, if you don't, when you were a child, from your, from your perspective, it's a real Santa Claus, okay? Looks like a Santa Claus, walks like a Santa Claus, quacks like a Santa Claus, must be a Santa Claus, okay? What's going on is that we have a certain a service interface for Santa Claus. Okay, what does a service interface mean? This is the attributes this is the interfaces that Santa Claus presents. So we have you know, Santa Claus, and then we have a set of attributes in terms of the size and shape and you know, how he walks and laughs and you know, gives you stuff. That's the service interface over here. The key idea behind virtualization is that if you maintain the service interface, you can change the implementation, and nobody will notice because the interface is maintained. So as long as every Santa Claus in every mall looks and talks and feels in roughly the same way, you don't know the difference, okay? And that's a virtual Santa Claus. So how does this work for, for VMware, let's say? So in VMware, what happens is that we have a processor, and we have a bunch of operating systems sitting on top of it. So for sake of argument, what I use is Mac OS, and then I have Windows, I have Windows, uh, whatever, some version. <clears throat> when I say this virtualization, what I mean is that the processor has a service interface over here. This service interface is nothing more than the instruction set that it supports. Remember, we talked about the stored program computer last class. So what the stored program computer is doing is it takes an instruction fetches it, decodes it, executes it, takes the next instruction, and so on. Each instruction is, in fact, the interface provided by the processor. 
It says, if you give me this instruction, I'll execute it. That's the interface. Just like Santa Claus says, if you ask me politely, I'll give you a gift. So if you ask me if you add, I'll add it. If you ask me to multiply, I'll do that. That's a service interface. The operating system uses this service interface in order to do things. The important thing that's going on is that some of these instructions, some of these instructions from the processor are meant to be executed only by one operating system. Okay. For example, declaring a certain part of the memory to be private. Nobody else can touch it. Declaring certain IOs to be. So there's some low level operations. Okay. And these low level operations are part of the service interface and typically are only executed by one operating system. What VMware does is that it categorizes the service interface into two parts. Those which can be shared without any problem. For example, you say add two numbers in memory and you put them together. Well, it doesn't really matter. It's not stepping on anybody else's toes. But things like you know, setting up page tables, things like some other operations are actually going to be privileged. They kind of not, should not be done by more than one system because they can hurt each other. So what they do is that this service interface, they kind of make into this dotted service interface. Okay, into these dotted ones, and so when and, and these are allocated, each is allocated to the a different one. So when the first operating system tries to execute this special instruction, what happens is that the VMware instruction set kicks in, the VMware program kicks in and gives it a fake instruction instead and says, okay, yeah, I took care of it, but actually you did something else. And the same thing for Windows, and you keep these two things separate from each other. Okay? And by doing this, what happens is that the processor service interface is now virtualized. Okay? It's, uh, you know, it's exactly like saying, you know, in this case, of Santa Claus, right? Uh, let's say that somebody goes to Santa Claus and says, uh, I have a message for Santa. Okay? All right? Give me the message. And then comes back the next week to a different mall and says, uh, what was it? Did Santa give me a reply back? <laughs> okay? So from the child's perspective, it should get a reply back, right? So you go to mall one and you say, here's a message to Santa. Well, you are Santa. Here, yeah. And you go back and say, do you have a reply for me? You want these two things to be the same. That's a privilege instruction. What you do to maintain that illusion is that you have these two Santas communicate with each other so that any message given to Santa is broadcast to all Santas everywhere in the universe. And they all know which child gave that message. So when somebody comes back and says, oh, yeah, sure, your child number one, two, three, four, A, B, X, you know, hex, of course. And this is the reply. What we've done here is to take the privilege instruction of this communication and did an implementation under the cover. So the child says, yeah, that's right. That's me. I am child one, two, three, four, A, B, X. And this is the reply back, great. So I really think you're Santa Claus. Because I went to that mall and this mall and they know what's going on. I can't tell the difference. In the same way, the Mac OS and the Windows can't tell the difference when you do this. And this is virtualization. It basically means take the service interface and partition it into privileged and non-privileged parts. Okay? The non-privileged one, give me a gift. Okay, here's a gift. Okay? Doesn't matter. There's no need for communication, no need for coordination. But it says, here's a message, you know, this is a part of the privilege interface. So by doing this, what happens is that we can actually run these two things. And it's almost like magic. You're running Windows, you're running Mac. Well, it's because all we have to do is to identify those elements or the service interface which are privileged and then take care of them specially. So <laughs> just to give you a small anecdote on this, VMware started in 1998. And my company actually started in 1998 as well. And what my company did was virtualization. We did virtualization in a different layer. Here we have the processor service interface, and you have two Mac OS. What we did was that we had the processor, and on top of it was the operating system. And the operating system has a service interface as well. And what we did was we gave sets of applications different service interfaces. So here's the interface, and we categorized them into, into uh, uh, privileged and non-privileged ones. And so whenever this set of processes access the OS interface, okay, for example, read, write, or you know, open a file, or do a socket communication, or you know, you'd look up process status, you know, things like that, 
Whenever it did something that was unprivileged, we would just let it use the existing operating system. But when it did something privileged, it becomes super user. Okay? Then we would give it a fake service interface over here by intercepting them and doing something to it. And so each of these sets of processes thought it had its own operating system. It's as if we were running uh, many operating systems. All, of course, the same operating system flavor, many different ones. So you'd have one operating system like Linux. It would look as if you're running 256 Linux, uh, Linux operating systems in the same box. Okay? And this is uh, useful for many different things. And uh, so this is what we did. So I told my students, well, just program Santa Claus. <laughs> okay? And that's what they did. Okay, it turned out to be quite a nice little idea. And we said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to put this in data centers. And then each person can have their own server. We call it a private server. And then you can, you can control your own private server without touching in anybody else, because you cannot actually see anybody else. You can only see your own private server, because you have your own service interface. Uh, to cut a very long story short, uh, we managed to convince a bunch of virtual, sorry, not virtual, uh, not virtual capitalists, but venture capitalists, <laughs> VC. <laughs> v is not virtual always. And uh, they gave us a big boatload of money to do this. Uh, they gave us about $85 million to do this. And we got it all done, beautiful. And then the minute we got it all working, the, we were selling it to telecom operators. All the telecom operators decided to go bankrupt simultaneously. It was a <laughs> coordinated failure. We thought one or two might go bust, but all of them went bust in 2001. And so we had a product and nobody to buy it. And uh, well, anyway, uh, to cut even a longer story short, I decided I didn't really like doing this anymore, and I came back to teaching. <laughs> but this is what we did. And so if you see a private server, you can actually go buy these things or rent these things. Uh, that's stuff that we did in 98, 99. And, uh, so I, I helped to name it as a private server. So that's my contribution to the world. <laughs> okay. uh, so I know a lot about virtualization, I guess, more than I want to. And it really is like Santa Claus. It really does work this way. And it's actually not that hard once you think about it and you know what you have to do over here. Okay. And uh, yeah, it works. Okay. Any questions about this? So the beauty of this is it can be done for any service interface. Any service interface you want, you can make it virtualized. And once you do it properly, the person on the other side, the person using that interface, cannot tell the difference. Cannot tell the difference at all. Other than the fact that because you're multiplexing, you have some performance problems. Other than the performance issue, you cannot tell the difference. So it's really quite a nice way to build systems. And today, you know, people talk about uh, iCloud, right? So I'll give you a prediction for this. You will have private servers in the iCloud in whatever, two years from now. So 2014, there will be private servers or something like your private server in the iCloud because they'll, they'll probably call it your server in the sky, iServer. I don't know what you're going to call it, but it, it's going to happen. And uh, I made that prediction in 2002. It hasn't happened yet. It will happen. Though. Okay. All right, last thing, soft state. Soft state, so let me talk about that. This is a nice trick to have, and it's a nice design principle to have. And the short way of removing it is forget it. OK. OK. Soft state, so what is state? State means something that's remembered, OK? All right? It's, it's state means anything that's, anything that's memory is state. Anything that's remembered is state. It shows up in many different systems, OK? And in some sense, soft state says that we want to actively forget things from time to time because state accumulates and, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it can, in the end, lead to a lo lot of uh, different uh, uh, problems. So uh, let me give you an analogy, and then I'll tell you what, how we use it. The analogy is that you, know, you, uh, you, 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 you accumulate a lot, lot of possessions. Okay? What this says is every once in a while, do a spring cleaning and get rid of stuff that you haven't used in a while, okay? because otherwise you have too much stuff. 
That's one, one way of thinking about it. Let me use a lock manager to explain how soft state might be used. So we have a lock manager, for example, and it has two entities that are both trying to acquire a particular lock. Okay, and there's a lock on some object over here, and this is the lock they're trying to acquire. So the first entity gets the lock, so this one wins, gets the lock, and then it dies. So now this process is sitting there and saying, OK, I want to use the lock, but can't, because somebody else has the lock. But this is never going to release the lock. OK? Well, what do you do? Right? One approach is to have a fault detection mechanism, where you say, OK, I'm going to look for this process. You know, Every process that dies must release locks. We're going to put all this elaborate machinery. right? The other way of doing it is really simple, which is that the lock manager, every certain amount of time, just removes, just deletes the lock. So after you hold the lock, after three minutes, it just expires, for example. The lock just goes away, as if you never had it. If you want to maintain the lock, you've got to re re renew it. You're going to go back and renew the lock every less than three minutes. You're just going to send a renewal message, otherwise it's going to go away. What happens now is that if this process dies, it won't renew it. If it won't renew it, the other one gets the lock. And life is good. It's a very, very simple mechanism. You have, it's unlikely you're going to get it wrong. But all you do is you say, three minutes, throw it out. And if within three minutes you're going to uh, renew it, you must be alive. Okay? So you can see the difference between the first one, which is called hard state, and the second one, which is soft state. Okay? Typically, people use hard state, but in the last 15, 20 years, they've realized more and more that soft state is better. Soft state is a better way, more robust way. I'll give you another example of this, which is a DHCP lease. If you remember, in DHCP, which is what we use in the LAN, we request an IP address, and the DHCP server says, OK, here's your IP address, and it says, this is your time to look. This is how long you have it for. If you want it again, renew it. Okay? Why? Because your computer may just leave. You may have a laptop that's given an IP address, and you just walk away after the end of the class, and you don't have it anymore. Then what? right? So with DHCP, you don't care. At the end of the lease, it's taken away from you. And so that's another example of soft state. Otherwise, every laptop that has to leave is going to have to send a message saying, OK, I'm leaving. You know, please remove my IP address and all this other stuff. You don't need to do that. It just disappears on its own. So in both cases, you have this uh, soft state that uh, helps you. So same can, the same approach can be used pretty much in any distributed system. And you know, I won't give you, uh, well, I run out of time, so I'm going to stop on that. OK, so let me just uh, summarize you know, what we've done in the last 24 lectures. So hopefully, by taking this class, you have some sense of what the internet looks like, a you know, little bit of what goes on under the covers and a little bit of uh, what distributed systems look like. I know you're not CS majors, but uh, still I hope this was a useful and enjoyable class. And I certainly enjoyed teaching it, so thank you.